Well, we got our white Christmas. We got our white Christmas. It just happened to come on January the 1st. I um, hope everybody had a wonderful New Year's Eve. I know that we did. Amy and I are pretty quiet. It's funny, you know, some years we want to go out and celebrate and be in a party type situation. Other times you just want to take it easy. Uh, earlier in the afternoon, I hung out with Curtis and James and all of our friends. Yeah. And all of our friends over at uh, his place. But now it is January the 1st, and although it's a day off for everybody, uh, we still got to get things going, get things moving. It's not really a day off for me. Amy and I cleaned up the house, got everything done. I have to race in Cleveland tonight. So we're all on our way over to uh, Macedonia in Cleveland, Ohio to race tonight. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's funny, you wake, up, you wake up the first day of the year and everybody wants to set resolutions and, you know, get off on the right foot, but I think... I feel we try to do that every single day. And I've never really been a big New Year's resolution guy because I'm always setting goals. And I always want to achieve them, whether it's January 1st or July 1st. And I think this year is, is no different for us. Obviously, we had a tremendous 2023. I'd said to Amy, every year, you know, you're eager you're eager to, oh, I can't wait for this year to be over. Oh, can't, you know, our jokes, you know saying how much they didn't like, people didn't like the year they were in, but we actually had a great year. Maybe one of the best years of my life, excluding, you know, the kids, the kids being born and my wife and I being married. It's 2023 was an exceptionally great year. And that was coming off a good 2022 where I'd won the gold cup with Sintra. We had a lot of stake wins. Again, you guys allowed us to buy some, some really talented, uh, deep pedigreed yearlings. So, you know, Hopes, expectations, dreams are high heading into 2024, but I wasn't in a big hurry to see 2023 go for sure. And as it comes to the horses, we uh, will start off on the right foot. We're bringing a number of babies in. We are bulging full now at, uh, at Northfield Park. I was told last night that we have six to come in immediately first part of the week, and we only have two stalls. So we're going to move two horses out send two horses back to Ontario. Two horses are actually going to have to stay over at Tim's um, that are heading back to Ontario to get their coggins done and get their shipping papers done. We will okay, begin... The What's that? The colors. The what? The colors we did yesterday. The colors? The colors? What colors, babe? The one we did was... Oh, for the babies? Yeah, everybody saw your colors video. They all thought it was very good. You did a great job on that. So, um... We're going to be moving a number of horses around. As I said, this is a time of year where a number of horses are going to be moved out. Now, some of them uh, are good horses that maybe don't get a chance to race right now or we feel that maybe their classifications are running out or in some cases maybe getting a little, a little sleepy, a little tired this time of year. So we always have to continue to move forward and, and I always try my best to tread lightly as mistakes are inevitable and you need to make as few as possible, especially in this game. So when it comes to uh, some of the horses that are on the list, they'll be surprising and some won't be surprising. But ultimately, we only have so many so many rooms in the hotel and uh, we have a list of horses. <laughs> we have a number we have and everybody that is below that list is gonna, is gonna potentially at least uh, be looked upon very carefully over the next week. Um, we won't be looking to acquire much over the next couple of days, as as I just said, we're full as, we're full as is. But I will be watching a number of horses that are getting ready to qualify on on the Ontario side that we just left. I think Dominic has what three that are ready to qualify right now, four or five that are on their way. We have six, seven, eight horses. We have six, seven, or eight horses that are getting ready to qualify here in Ontario. I know we have at least three or four to qualify uh, Wednesday in. Uh, Wednesday at Northfield Park, and a couple of ones that are, are very close also. So we have a number of horses on the horizon. Our two-year-olds, some of them have been back in and will begin training this week. I know that Dominic said, did he say he started with Drevin or he's starting this week? I think he said he's starting to train him this week. So a lot of exciting prospects. Obviously, the whole point of getting the horses ready right now, for the babies anyway, is to see what they are and what they aren't. If they're overnight horses, we'll race them until their classifications run out or, or appear to be running out, and then they'll be moved. If they're stake horses or appear to be stake horses, one horse that's in a very, very tricky spot is Time Is On My Side. 
This is a horse I trained in two minutes the other day. Probably going to train him another hard mile next week. Then we'll qualify him twice. He'll likely race at the Meadows under Tim. But is he a stake horse? Is he a sire stake horse? Is he a stallion series horse? Is he a horse that we're going to modestly stake? Or is he an overnight horse? I have no idea. And that may sound silly to you. It may sound silly to hear me say, I don't know. There's no way to know. You know, those, I trained him in two minutes. So he only has to go 10 seconds faster to be an effective sire stake horse in 2024. And if it looks like he is going to be, we can't race him January through October. So that's a great question, honey, because he's going to get too tired. Yes, punchy. That's another exciting part of 2024. A huge transition for us. Uh, let me finish with time first. So time is on my side. Um, if it looks like he's going to be a stake horse of any caliber, we're probably going to have to rest him. He's probably going to race three, four, five times the most. Three or four, likely. And then we'll shut him down for three weeks, rest him up maybe four weeks, and make sure that he is ready for the start of stake season. So a lot goes into that file, so to speak, that horse. And then as Addie just punched, or just just said, she was excited about Punchy being in full. We are going to breed Punch the Clock. If many of you, I've been a little coy about it because I wanted to make sure that I felt I was on the right path. And I believe I did my homework. You know, I talked to a number of breeders. I talked to a lot of, uh, you know, people that I would say I, I, I trust uh, the information that I was getting from them and, and could absorb it in a way that that was useful. Uh, and Punch the Clock will be bred to Walner and will uh, will be shipped out. Now, she's going to Southwind Farms because, one, that's where Walner stands. Have to make sure this filly gets in full because the, the breeding, and that was the trickiest part, the negotiated breeding for Walner, which is hard to believe. He, he was full and close, full and close, full and close. You can't find any, you can't find any. We had to pay uh, above market and upfront for him, theoretically. So... The, there's no guaranteed live foal, so the quicker we get her in a position where she's ready to be bred, the less stress on uh, on me, for sure. So over the next, at one sec, sweetheart. I saw you didn't do your hair. I was going to say you look like Mowgli, but I, I was going to leave it alone there. You okay, though? <laughs> uh, as long as you do your hair tonight before you go to bed, all right? Okay? So, um... There'll be a lot of people moving shares around of Punch the Clock. She is not going to race. She is going to be bred to Walner, and there'll be a size... Well, I guess I should tell everybody, since the people that there are people that may want to buy those shares also. Uh, we had to give $50,000 up front. 10000 of it has to be paid as of last night, um, and 40000 by the end of January, which is a, a large, steep cost, and there's going to be a lot of people out there saying, I, I don't agree with that, I think it's a mistake, I, I think you're going down the road, maybe I'm right, and some of my closest friends have said that, I talked to Steve about it, I know Steve was was against it, he thought that maybe um, there was a lot to risk, but my take on it is simple, and, and I, I guess I will expand just a little bit on it, my take on Punch the Clock is simple, here's a filly that is one of the freshest tree limbs of one of the strongest families right now. Now, of course, you have the world champion families that have thrown world champions. This is King of the North's sister by Tactical Landing. Tactical Landing is one of the most sought-after uh, breedings right now, aside from Walner, in racing. Now, obviously, he's too young to have to have any sort of information to go on as far as broodmare sires is concerned, but an interesting prospect nonetheless. Nonetheless, Walner uh, is the sire of King of the North. So there is some, uh, yeah. there is some, something to look at there in regards to the breeding. Now, in regards to uh, Punch the Clock herself, when you have your brother syndicated for millions of dollars, who was a world champion, and I think it's important to note. I said this to everybody: we bought Punch the Clock for one hundred eighty thousand dollars U.S. out of Kentucky before King of the North was King of the North. He was good at two, but he had not won a race as a sophomore when we when we bought her. After that. He'd won the Breeders' Crown and been one of the hottest three-year-olds on the planet at the end of the season. Uh, wait, wait, did he win the Breeders' Crown? He won the big race in Ontario. Yeah, in Ontario, right, yeah, no, right. Such a such a big mile, and, you know, Mark Trouble, great. Um, but here you have a half-sister to him. 
and the other sister is the through the Instagram model. So Punch the Clock's sister, who never really showed a lot in the track. Now, I can make an argument as to Punch the Clock could have been any type of filly. That one start that she had in the mud, 58, 27, and 4 in the end of it, and closing hard at the wire. It's hard for somebody that is not an owner or somebody who is in the Punch the Clock group or in the stable to say that that filly could have been any type of filly. But I know that she had a ton of talent, a lot of speed and a lot of power under the hood. And when you factor all of that in, I guess it really boils down to why would I look to take a little loss or try my hardest to break even on, on one of the freshest sides of a very, very strong family in horse racing. And that is really what it boiled down to. So there's going to be people out there that are selling their shares of Punch the Clock, and I have to change the notation beside her to Broodmare now so that everybody knows. But an exciting chapter. It's disappointing that we don't get to race her. I know Amy wanted to race her really bad, and I did too. But with such such an exciting chapter ahead as a Broodmare, it was a, one of the most unique situations we've ever been in at the stable and most certainly the most unique situation on the breeding side. So that that page is beginning to turn. Uh, now I, I notice a lot of breeders do watch our videos, I guess, because I've been contacted by a few of them. That doesn't mean that there's gonna be a ton of money out there because there's a lot of risk, right? We've already we've already agreed to put up that, that huge amount of money up front for the breeding of Walner. Then the, the filly has to stay healthy, the baby has to stay healthy inside of her. And what we do, I've I outlined a plan to our uh, to our owners of uh, Punch the Clock of what my plan would look like and had a wonderful discussion with, with another breeder about that particular video and uh, was in agreement. Now, that breeder obviously sees a lot more um, from his side of the fence as to why this would be beneficial for, for him. Uh, but nevertheless, an exciting part, just another opportunity for us to learn, for me to learn especially a, a new facet in the industry that I was never really interested in. And, and when it comes to breeding the horses, I defer to many, many smarter people in the stable that know a lot more about breeding than me. Uh, we are in the midst of and almost locking in all of uh, the broodmares for, for the year, bred to stallions. I think we have secured three breedings to Captain Corey. Who are those two again? I think My Jazz, Path of Totality. Who is the third one? Eyes of 10? I think you're right. Eyes of 10. Globe trotting, we're yet to. I know I'm leaning towards, I guess, Father Patrick, only because I've talked to three people that I would call close friends that, that I would, that I believe are, are uh, very, very knowledgeable. Now, you don't want to throw the word expert around easily, but extremely knowledgeable people on the breeding side, and all three of them agreed that Father Patrick was amongst the top three to breed her too. Bit of a, bit of a, well, listen. She's booked in a green shoe full, and I hope the green shoes go good this year. But the Father Patrick, obviously, green shoe is by Father Patrick also. But um, the Father Patrick angle, we've had some luck with Father Patrick. There's no slam dunks. You know, if you have five that are remedial to no good and a couple that are really good, you're having a pretty good run. So I, I am maybe leaning towards that. And then we have our, our horse that Joel and I own, and, and John, uh, State Park. Maybe go back to Volstead. Stop. Maybe go back. What's up? What the hell? I never thought of that. What the hell? Yeah, I, I have to ask. I'm gonna ask. I usually my first go to with the breeding. Yeah, he isn't. He's a Volstead. So that's a good point. Also, we have some information on the ground in, in actual horse flesh. We have a Volstead out of State Park S uh, that looks very very nice in, in Kentucky. That's a very very smart thing too, all maybe. Uh, so maybe that is an indicator of where we should go. I know that uh, it was a running kind of joke that we had kind of bred Muscle Chrome close, right? Muscle Chrome is by Muscle Mass. You see that whole Muscle Hill line. And we bred her to Long Tom, who's by Muscle Hill. So some people are saying that's kind of inbred. It's really close. And we had gone Long Tom, Long Tom, and then uh, what was the one last year? Hockey's fine. I can't ever think of it. It's not Coach K. No, it wasn't Quattro de Julio. That, I think that was... No, it was the one that Aki had. Anyway, it doesn't matter. 
But when I look at the Colt, I, I view right now, uh, I don't play nice as one of our top, top prospects. Now, we've trained them one time with a stopwatch. So please take anything I say, especially this time of year, with it with more than a grain of salt. But when I see how clean he trots, how big he is, how strong he is, and how good his attitude is, he is one of our top prospects. So it would be, I think, crazy not to go back to long time, close or not. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Who else do we have? We have Punch the Clock going to Walnut. We have three Captain Quarries. Okay. We have Long Tom. No, no, Cake is a boy. Uh, Cake's in at the burn in Ohio. Who else do we got? That doesn't matter. We 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 will have them all solidified by this week. This I glare. I had bought the the share of international money. First time I'd ever done that. Also. Uh, and that share will be used for a glare AM. We have, she's in fall right now. It's an exciting time of year. We have eight mares in fall right now. Four weanlings on the fall for, on the ground for next year. And eight mares uh, in fall also. Now how we, I already have people saying, Anthony, you get those four weanlings, are you going to sell shares of them? That's a great question. I never really thought of that before. And I think it would be quite easy just to keep everything in house. You know, I have zero interest in selling them publicly, but keeping them in-house makes sense also. So we'll probably work out some sort of mechanism for people to get involved in those weanlings uh, also as we head into the summer. Just so many exciting things happening at the stable. Um, every facet of the stable has, uh, has eyeballs on it right now. And just, I'm really excited about 2024. And I hope you are too. So with that... Uh, I believe I've somewhat updated you. We have a lot of horses, as I said, training, qualifying, getting ready to go. We got a lot of horses racing this week. We do have some horses that will be selling. They'll likely be in the preferred sale next Monday. And we're talking about, you guys know what we're talking about, Rito's Lady, Electric Line. There may be some, some deeper looking horses. I can tell you that if all gas, no brakes doesn't get entered, doesn't get in on Monday, he'll likely be in the preferred sale. And then I'm still mulling over horses like Stay Close or, or even think of Galaxies. I mean, she's racing so good and it's irreplaceable. You can't replace her. But when I look at the, when I look at her, when I step back and look at her, you know, drawing the outside and a half mile track, tough thing to do. Hopefully she draws inside this week. Dayton. You know, there's, there's sharks waiting for her everywhere, right? Dayton, the Meadows, Ontario. They said, geez, you know, that class went and 51 or 15 a piece over Mohawk. Jeez, so much more is such a good mare. But And then James had said to me last night, he said, well, a couple of those mares, the fillies are going to be bred. Those mares are going to be bred. And he said, I just don't think it'll fill. But that's an option also, is to bring her over here. Something else that I have to think about. So just to, as the year starts, as you guys see, there's so many things going on in, in my head. Um, it, it's not my favorite time of year. For sure. Obviously, we just exited. Today is officially the end of Christmas season, which is disappointing. I spend 60 days celebrating Christmas, and it ended uh, this morning. So now this is a time of year when stake payments are coming, and horses are coming back out of the field and see how they train down. Other horses are being moved around. Stalls we get short of. So who's coming to Ontario? How many stalls do we have in Ontario? Who's going to Northfield? How many stalls do we have in Northfield? Are there other horses to move around? Just a lot. You found them? That's a girl. Uh, just a lot, uh, a lot going on. So an exciting time of the year is it is the 1st of January. It is the first steps of the new year, the newest year uh, for all of us. And excitement is high. Expectations are tempered but quietly high. And uh, definitely excited about what lies ahead. And I hope you are too. So, uh, oh, one more note. I had, I was going to mention that I, I'm, I'm going to reach out to some people about selling some of the racehorses that I have a number of shares in uh, over the next little while just to make things a little easier for, for me. And as I can't offer discounts on Boxing Day or any day for that matter because I can't dilute the front of the stable, there are shares that I own. So I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I am going to be looking for partners on some of the racehorses that we are going with right now, and some of the babies also, but the babies are always up there for you guys to sell. So I had been reaching out to some people about Crantini, and I see that most of those shares are gone, so thank you very much for partnering with me on him. Uh, we have Walter's Keepsake. We have a number of horses that are floating around. So with that, I'm going to let you go. 
we'll talk to you all very soon. But I, but most importantly, I hope you all had a safe, happy, and wonderful New Year's Eve holiday season. And uh, although my favorite time on Earth is over, stables running strong here, January first, two thousand and twenty-four.